I'll just hand it over to Divya from now on. Okay. Yeah. Good evening, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. I'm able to hear you. Okay. So we'll begin uh, in another four or five minutes. Sure, sir. Okay. Come on, sir. Good evening all uh, attendees and uh, organizers and uh, our honorable speaker. Uh, I request you all to put your uh, mobile devices on silent mode as we don't want any uh, frequency uh, disturbance. Thank you. We will begin in another couple of minutes. We're just waiting for a couple of people to come. Thank you. 
கால் பண்ணிக்கலாம் அப்பா இஸ் ஜஸ்ட் ஜாயின் அப்பா இஸ் ஜஸ்ட் ஜாயின் Shall we begin, sir? Yeah, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Okay. Hearty Sunday greetings to everyone present this evening. Today evening, we are gathered here for yet another webinar organized by our safety cluster uh, team, uh, guided by none other than my respected father-in-law, Dr. Devi Giri Shrina. Uh, the webinar special guest today is Mr. Yoganan Badari. He is an associate safety professional from the Board of Certified Safety Professionals uh, in the United States of America. He has done his uh, Master of Science in Biology from uh, Western Kentucky University, United States of America. He has a decade of experience uh, in uh, EHS domain as a registered biological uh, safety professional. from the american biological uh, safety association and as a lead auditor certified by uh, the international register of certified auditors uh, from approved by the ohsas uh, 18001 2007 our guest will be sharing his knowledge on biological safety which is the need of the our uh, amidst the ongoing pandemic I now hand over the session to uh, Mr. Yoganan. We welcome you, sir. Thank you so much for your time and uh, agreeing to uh, participate on this webinar. We welcome you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Divya. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Divya, for your kind introduction. And I'd like to thank uh, Safety Cluster for giving me an opportunity to talk today. Uh, in today's uh, session so before uh, going into today's presentation i'd like to uh, to uh, briefly tell uh, the audience what i used to do before uh, taking a lateral entry into uh, safety domain so after my ms at uh, western kentucky university i worked as a research assistant both in uh, industry and uh, academia uh, for 6 years in the usa before relocating uh, to india in 2009 in 2009 i joined uh, singin international limited which is a contract research organization organization which is a biocon company as a senior scientist and uh, worked uh, with a dedicated client uh, called uh, bristol myers squibb they are a major pharma player in uh, the us so uh, in 2012 when there was an opportunity available uh, to lead the newly formed uh, department of biological safety uh, i took over that role this gave me a, a opportunity to study about the projects before they are, they were initiated uh, my role was to basically uh, give inputs on the safety aspects of the project uh especially working on the biological assessments of risks uh giving uh, like uh, inputs on what kind of engineering controls and uh, ppe requirements uh, for the pro uh, project uh, that is about to be initiated i'm going to my uh, actual presentation now so switching over i'm hoping that everybody is able to see my screen okay so uh, i just change the uh, slide now okay so the topic my topic uh, of talk today is biological safety the need of the hour so uh, i have pasted a symbol uh, here uh, just uh, below my topic of today's presentation so most of you uh, know the symbol that have uh, pasted on the slide uh, i am hoping so this is the universal symbol for biohazardous material i'll just give a brief uh, uh, history about this symbol 
So this symbol was designed by uh, Charles Baldwin in 1966. Uh, at that time, he used to work with the uh, Dow Chemicals Company uh, when we uh, discovered this. The aim of this uh, is this uh, symbol is to create something which is entirely meaningless. However, it should be memorable. So this blaze orange color symbol is easily visible and recognizable even during harsh, harsh conditions. So this, this is uh, the brief history of uh, this biological safety uh, or biohazardous symbol. So going to the next slide. So this is how I want to run uh, my presentation for the next half hour or so. I'll be talking about uh, what is uh, all about uh, biological safety. So what is biosafety? Why is it impo important to have biosafety as a safety domain? At different levels of biological safety and uh, biological safety infrastructures like biosafety cabinets, laboratory design, decontamination agents, uh, etc. And I tried my best to keep the presentation in the context of uh, COVID-19 and will try to give uh, historical examples uh, to add interest uh, to uh, the audience. So what is the biological safety? So I have just pasted uh, the CDC's definition. CDC is Center for Disease Control uh, USA. CDC's definition of biological safety. Biosafety is uh, application of safety precaution that reduce uh, laboratorians' risk of exposure to potentially infectious material and limit contamination of work environment and ultimately the community. So I'll give you just a few uh, examples of uh, why we should be talking about uh, uh, biological safety. Right? So if you take a look at these pictures, uh, uh, I'd like to uh, have your focus on uh, uh, the first picture, which is on the left-hand side. Uh, this picture on, uh, is that of a kid suffering from smallpox. Okay, and uh, smallpox is caused by a virus called variola virus, which was a global pandemic for uh, centuries. The origin of this virus is the uh, was unknown and it dates back to uh, 3rd century uh, BC, BCE. Uh, is... I'm here. 3rd century BCE and uh, um, it, uh, basically they found this uh, from uh, uh, mummified bodies as a uh, rash in, uh, on their bodies, among, on the mummified bodies. So in India, smallpox was found in 7th century uh, due to its in, increased trade with the South Asian countries and Middle Eastern countries. So uh, in, nine, in 1796, uh, one researcher, or maybe it was due to uh, uh, serendipity, which means by just by uh, chance, Sir Edward Jenner discovered this vaccine uh, and WHO, which is World Health Organization, declared the world free of smallpox only on 8th May 1980, which is almost two centuries after the vaccine was discovered. So just, uh, I want you to have the context, like why I'm telling all this uh, now, right? So, now we'll, I'll want you to focus on the middle picture. <clears throat> this picture is uh, of a boy uh, who's affected with polio virus. Polio again is thought to have its own origins in Egypt and found around 1400 BCE. So India contracted uh, polio in 1700s, again due to its trade with other countries. 
So an inactivated polio vaccine was discovered by Dr. John Asal, and it was first used in 1955. India was declared officially polio free only in 2014, 60 years after the vaccine was discovered. So now we'll uh, go to the picture on the right, right hand side. So most of you by now should be knowing what this picture is. The picture is that of a virus in Coronaviridae family, which is uh, currently, I mean, we have this uh, global pandemic going on. Uh, COVID-19 also falls in this uh, family. These viruses majorly affect the respiratory system. Other viruses which created a pandemic and uh, epidemic outbreaks were Spanish flu in the 1920s, swine flu in the early 2000s, and there are there are, there are conspiracy theories which believe that COVID-19 is a man-made virus and discovered in the in a laboratory. Without giving much importance to those theories, I just just want, wanted to use this to create a context to my upcoming slides. So we'll switch over to the next slide. So why biological safety? After people started documenting the natural outbreaks as well as laboratory acquired or hospital acquired uh, infections, importance was given to biological safety. Nations and research laboratories started focusing on biological safety only after multiple uh, incidents. So as you can see from this slide, there are multiple newspaper articles talking about laboratory acquired uh, and hospital acquired in infection illnesses. So we will talk about these uh, some of these uh, diseases which were spread because of uh, laboratory acquired or hospital acquired at later part of my uh, talk today. But we'll uh, now uh, go into the next slide. So why do we 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 now talk about why do we need biological safety? So in the context of occupational health and safety, laboratories and hospitals are highly hazardous workplaces. And the risk here depends on the type of biological agents that are being dealt with or worked upon. These workplaces are not only a threat to workers, but also to the environment if there is any accidental infection or accidental release of highly infectious agent into the environment if appropriate safety control measures are not taken. So research or hospital staff are required to adhere to strict regulatory guidelines while working while working uh, with highly infectious agent, uh, agents or in, in patients who are thought to have uh, infections. SARS CoV 2 or COVID 19 falls under biological safety level 3, which is considered as highly infectious agent. So, what are these biological safety levels? So, we will talk about it in the upcoming slides. So, I will briefly talk about the risks and routes of exposure and assessments of risk. So, as every safety professional knows, risk is equal to hazard times exposure times vulnerability, vulnerability or severity. So, however, in the context of biological safety, your hazard depends on the biological safety level or infection agent. Right? We will go into uh, the levels in the upcoming slide. However, I will take you through the routes of exposure. So there are different routes of exposures. So if you can see, inhalation right, is one route of exposure. Currently, the COVID-19 is uh, 
does fall under this uh, category where if you inhale the virus which is shed by a uh, person who is carrying then we are bound to we are suppose we, we are bound to get uh, infected by uh, this route inhalation route the next is splash on the onto the face and indirect contact so a lot of us are being now told that the surfaces are contaminated could be contaminated with virus so this is a kind of indirect contact so if you touch a surface and you touch your body parts especially near the nose eyes or mouth region you will uh, contract this uh, disease covid the next is inoculation so inoculation is something like if uh, a person is um, infected with a virus and is injected with uh, something uh, injected using a syringe needle and the syringe needle accidentally pricks a doctor or a healthcare worker they and they contract this disease this route is called as inoculation inoculation by means of needle prick injuries or other cut injuries uh, is called inoculation and the last one is ingestion if you directly are in uh, ingesting uh, which means that you are having it through your mouth that kind of infections are called as uh, is uh, through uh, ingestion route of exposure is through in ingestion so risk assessment is nothing but a set of framework for constructing comprehensive biological safety and security architecture and there are four pa parameters which decides this uh, risk assessments which are hazard identification hazard characterization exposure assessment and risk characterization your biological assessment of risk are based on these four parameters. We we'll go to the next slide now. So all safety professionals should be familiar with this picture of this inverse pyramid. This is nothing but hierarchy of controls, which is applicable even for biological safety. Elimination and substitution is generally in most of the cases is taken at project decision making stages right and only after thorough uh, investigation and thorough thought process if elimination and substitution is not feasible a decision is made to work on a project with an infectious agent so once a decision is made to work on a project using a certain infectious agent, other parameters in hierarchy of controls kicks in. As a biosafety professional, appropriate engineering controls, administrative controls need to be designed and appropriate PPEs, personal protective equipment, need to be selected for carrying out the project safely. So engineering controls is nothing but uh, facilities design, secondary containment uh, equipment like biosafety uh, cabinets or laminar airflow hoods. So these are all engineering controls like access control uh, to a laboratory, air handling units. All these are uh, all these fall under engineering control. Administrative, administrative controls are like biological safety practices, trainings. So all these are uh, all these fall under administrative control. PPEs again are, as everybody knows, respirators, Tyvek suits. These are all PPEs. So now we will go into the next slide, and uh, I'll talk. About about the biosafety levels in details. I'll spend some time on this slide. And if there are any questions on this, you may want to write it down and uh, ask me at the end of the uh, talk. So 
Biosafety levels are like pillars or backbone of practice of biological safety. This needs thorough risk assessment and most importantly, a professional judgment is re required, required to apply the right level. So, let us go to level one. Level one is where no or low individual and community risks, right? If you are working with certain organism in, uh, or a certain agent which causes no risk, then it is it falls under biosafety level one. Examples are Saccharomyces, E. coli, all these which is listed here is biological safety level one. The next level is if you are working with an uh, organism or infectious agent which causes moderate level risk, low community risk, and the pathogen can cause disease but not likely to be serious. Laboratory exposures, it may cause laboratory exposures but not to, to a serious infection. Effective treatment is available. It can be preventive uh, or a preventive measure is available for the, such kind of infections. And risk of spread is of this infection is very limited. There is no or limited risk of spread of this infection. So those organisms fall under this bi biosafety level two. Like for example, hepatitis, streptococcus, borella, salmonella. These are all biosafety level two. Uh, infectious agents and for most of it there is either a treatment or a preventive measure so the next is biosafety level three now we are talking about something which is highly contagious highly pathogenic so the risk is very high and it's moderate uh, community risk pathogens usually cause serious disease and ordinarily spread from one infected individual to another in, 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 infected another individual through respiratory transmission. So COVID-19 falls under this uh, category. Preventive measures are available for this kind of uh, infectious agents. However, but uh, if there is uh, infection, it is very difficult and it, uh, it will take time for it to uh, get cured or go, go away on its own. Like we have seen COVID-19, there is almost like 90, 92% recovery. And uh, only in around 2% cases, uh, it is uh, fatal. So the next we'll talk about is why safety level four. Dangerous and exo exotic, posing a high risk or aerosol transmitted infection. High in, uh, highly pathogenic to both individual as well as community. Pathogens usually cause serious diseases and can be deadly. These are readily transmittable from one individual to another individual, directly or indirectly. Both directly and, and definitely there is no treatment for this kind of. Uh, Diseases. Now we have a smallpox uh, vaccination and smallpox is eradicated, but it falls under biosafety level 4 category. So we will take go to the next slide. So in this slide, I will talk about biological safety practices required for dealing with pathogens falling under biosafety level three. As I mentioned before in my previous slide, these organisms are seriously or potentially lethal diseases through respiratory transmission. And examples are COVID-19, tuberculosis, all of these falls under, these two fall under biosafety level three. So scientists working 
on this project should be under medical surveillance and should receive vaccination if it is available. So why do we need medical surveillance? So in case it is, if there is accidental infection, we will know, we will have, we have data of the medical record before the scientist started the work and during the period of his work, we will take, we will do a medical surveillance so that we will know when he has, if he has contract, when or if he has contracted these diseases. So workplaces are only for authorized, so laboratories are, have, will have authorized entry only for that too, only for trained personnel and all these labs should be access control, strictly at 100% access control, either uh, under lock and key or access control reader, some kind of engineering control, administrative control should be there for uh, to ensure that it is uh, having only authorized entry. And uh, by these labs will have biosafety cabinets, eye washers, and emergency, emergency shower, showers and uh, uh, other engineering controls, which are required mandatorily in this laboratories. Air exhaust should be 100% through HEPA filters, and there should not be any recirculation. All the doors should be self-closing and automatic locking without uh, automatic locking and restricted access, as I mentioned before. So we'll go into the next slide now. This slide captures the design of the lab biosafety cabinet that is used for working on biosafety level three organisms. So while working on biosafety level three pathogens, it is important that the researcher uses biosafety cabinet, which is class two B2 which is a total exhaust cabinet with no air circulations. This can uh, contain biological, which means that uh, you can simultaneously work with the biological and chemical agents at the same time. So for example, some of the experiments require use of uh, chemicals which are highly hazardous, like for example, phenol or uh, other uh, chemicals uh, like thionides, which are highly poisonous. And at the same time, you need uh, to work with biological agents also. So this kind of biosafety uh, cabinets can be used to work simultaneously with biological as well as chemical agents. So inflow air velocity of this kind of cabinets is uh, 100 trillion feet per minute and exhaust is 1200 cubic feet per minute of room air. Exhaust fans should have an emergency backup. So as you can see in the previous uh, slide, so emergency backup of fan and other uh, power backup of fan and other equipment is uh, required while working in such kind of uh, uh, cabinets, while using this kind of cabinets. This is in case there is a power failure, like uh, employees or workers should not get affected with uh, the infectious agents they are working on. So that is the reason why they have this emergency power backup. And in spite of all this, the employees for our staff who are working with working on infectious agents, they have to they should be using PPEs with respirators. So even if everything fails, as a precaution, they are using this PPE as a backup with a respirator with a respirator. The exhaust fan should be uh, with power backup and the HEPA filter aids gets exhausted 100% from the room through the cabinet. So we'll go to the next slide.
This is about uh, biosafety class three cabinets. This is available in all high containment laboratories where research using highly hazardous and infectious agents are carried out. This is a gas tank cabinet and uh, leaks greater than one into 10 to the power of minus seven cc per second, which is tested with 1% test gas at three inches pressure water gauge is not accepted. So if there is a leak, it is not accepted. Oh, this one into 10 to the power of minus seven cc per second. This is not accepted and we cannot validate or work in such kind of biosafety cabinets. These cabinets does not have an opening window like or a sash. So nothing uh, is there for, for such kind of for this kind of uh, uh, biosafety cabinets. There is only a pass box, passage of material is through a dunk tank and double door pass box is there with a water clip, water clip. So supply of air is supply and exhaust are both with HEPA filters. And this entire cabinet is negatively pressured. And the lab also should be negatively pressured. So this is the schematic of a class three uh, biosafety cabinet. As you can see, uh, there is a negative pressure inside the biosafety in this section view. And in the front end view, you can see there are four chambers which are given, and these are with rubber gloves. Right? Both input and out uh, exhaust are both HEPA filtered. So we'll go to the next slide now. So to test the operational integrity of a biosafety cabinet, it must be validated. It must be validated and certified when it is installed in the laboratory. Or if there is a repair work which went into the biosafety cabinet, after the repair work, it has to be certified. Or even if it is relocated from lab, one lab to another lab, these biosafety uh, cabinets should be validated. And also after every filter change, HEPA filter change, it should be validated. Even if nothing is done in the using the biosafety cabinet, it has to be tested and certified annually by a competent person. So these are the next slide which I will be talking about are uh, practices for a COVID-19 diagnostic laboratory. So there might be uh, audiences or there might be someone who you know of work in a diagnostic laboratory. I thought I will uh, share one slide with uh, what is the requirement for a COVID-19 diagnostic laboratory. So laboratory employees working with suspected samples uh, shall be working only within the biosafety type 2. B2 cabinet. We have already talked about what biosafety type 2 cabinet is and should adhere to strict aerosol transmission prevention measures such as the employee or uh, the person who is working on the uh, samples should always wear direct full body suit and gloves and uh, the cabinet shall have a filtered part, not uh, the not the cabinet, the respirator shall have HEPA filtered power, powered air purifying respirator, also called as PAPRs. Perform all sorting and diagnostics within the HEPA filtered uh, aerosol management system and wipe down all surfaces before and after sorting the diagnostic procedure with 70% ethanol or 10% hypochlorite, hypochlorite or bleach. Operate only within the facility with the negative relative air pressure with respect to surrounding places. So the, the air pressure inside the lab should be negative relative to the outside environment. With exhaust air vented directly to the outside rather than circulating to other spaces. So a written record of contaminant uh, measurement and safety checklist should be maintained. 
and other logs, whatever is necessary, should be kept appropriately. This is uh, recommended by American Biological Safety Association. Even ICMR uh, recommends this uh, guidelines for uh, employees working in a diagnostic laboratory, especially people who are now working uh, on uh, rapid testing or uh, uh, RT-PCR. They have to uh, take all measures to ensure that they are not infected with the samples that they receive or that they work on. So I will go to the next slide now. So again, all the safety professionals uh, are very familiar with this uh, picture that I have shown here. So this is a picture of an iceberg. So laboratory uh, infection, right? just like other safety domains, even in biological safety, what is known about biological safety is very limited. What is hidden is very huge. So it, uh, it can be, for example, who contracted infections while working in a laboratory? Are they asymptomatic? Did they carry the infection into general public? And this slide now correlates with very well with uh, the COVID-19 situation. So as mentioned in the beginning of my presentation, we will talk about uh, some of the laboratory acquired infections. So I have given the title of this slide as Great Escape, right? How infectious agents escaped the lab is what I wanted to uh, show in this uh, slide. So in 1972, a 23-year-old 23, 23 lab assistant at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine died of smallpox while harvesting live virus from egg on open bench. So this is uh, the reason why uh, appropriate training is required and uh, biosafety practices need to be followed to ensure that people or uh, employees know what they are working on. So if they don't know what they are working on and if uh, they are working some on something like a small box on an open bench, these kind of incidents are bound to happen. Right? So second incident is in uh, 1978, a medical photographer at Birmingham Medical School accidentally got exposed to smallpox virus from a research lab on the floor below, and he died. So he was on the uh, top floor where, and uh, below his floor was a lab where they were working on smallpox virus. And this got accidentally exposed, he got accidentally exposed and because of which he died. This led, this death led the HOD, then HOD of the microbiology department to commit suicide. So there are so many effects after effects of uh, such kind of incidents. The next is that this is in India. A 28-year-old researcher in India sustained a cut injury while freezing a wire of buffalo pox virus. He survived, but he had a long time suffering. So people will have people should be very researchers or uh, laboratory professional, healthcare professionals should be very careful when they are working with the infectious agents. So this table captures the laboratory acquired infections, and this is the pre-COVID COVID-19 table. If you see, there are diseases like the brucellosis, Q fever, hepatitis. And typhoid, it tops the list actually. And there are 20 deaths because of uh, typhoid, thalurinia, tuberculosis. Right? There are several diseases because of which, like accidental or laboratory acquired infection, led to death of so many researchers. And now, 
We have plenty of infections due to COVID-19, which are laboratory acquired as well as hospital acquired infections. So we will get to know the data once it is released. So this slide captures a survey of lab and people's behavior by Philip Settle in 1965. We more or less see this trend even today. So accidents due to human error are only human error of 65 percent, unsafe acts 15 percent, equipment problem 20 percent, and most of the accidents are prone uh, in the age group of between 20 to 29, and mostly men are involved in such kind of activities. And this is the data which uh, was published in 1965. So I'll go to the next slide, which is decontamination of biohazardous pills. So this is very important. Like, if there are any um, professionals working in a lab environment, they have to know like how to contain a biohazardous pills. Firstly, they have to pardon out the area and allow the aerosols to settle. And if there is a biosafety cabinet in that lab, in that particular room, they should allow the biosafety cabinet to run for at least five hours to ensure that all the aerosols which are there in the room because of the spillage, they escape through the biosafety cabinet and all the uh, aerosols are captured in the HEPA pit. The emergency team should be notified, evacuate all the personnel to a safe assembly point. So if the uh, employees are trained on how to deal with the biohazardous pills, they can do they can clear it up but if they don't know if they are not trained on it they should wait for emergency response team to take appropriate action so they will be donning appropriate uh, protective equipment and they will pour appropriate decontaminating agent why i say the appropriate decontaminating agent is every agent will be uh, cleaned by a different agent. For example, if it is a, if it is blood, quaternary uh, ammonium compounds should be used to clean the spill. If it is like, for example, COVID-19 spillage, like if there is a uh, viral transport media of a uh, sample which has COVID-19 sample in it, it spills, then the kind of decontaminating agent used for such kind of spill is different. So appropriate decontaminating agent should be used uh, after knowing what kind of spill it is. So for COVID-19, usually they use uh, sodium hypochlorite right, uh, to spill, uh, to contain the spill and allow enough contact, contact time for the agent to neutralize the spill. So after pouring uh, the decontaminating agents, you should not be cleaning off, uh, cleaning it off immediately. You should allow enough contact time, at, at least 15 to 30, uh, half an hour. 15 minutes to half an hour should be allowed to uh, settle, like with enough uh, decontaminating agent. And then it is wiped out using the spill kit. Wipe wipe up the spill and dispose the waste into the biohazard bag. Reapply the decontaminating agent and repeat the procedure. And once this is done, the area is completely fumigated. As you can see, the area is um, completely fumigated with the appropriate agent again, like for example, uh, formaldehyde. Right? Formaldehyde is generally used as a fumigation agent. So what is the right way forward? 
for uh, applying the bioeffective principle. Right way forward is educate yourself. And once people are experienced, like after appropriate training, right, this will be the right way forward. Education, experience, and training. So these are the three important factors which will lead to which will not lead to any uh, incidents. So I'll just briefly touch upon the Indian government efforts uh, for uh, effective biological safety uh, guidelines. Right? This originates from Environment Protection Act 1986. There are three provisions of EPA, uh, 6, 8, and 25. And the, the government also introduced the biosafety rules in 1989. So rules, of uh, rules for manufacture, use, import, and storage of hazardous microorganisms, genetically engin engineered microorganisms, or cells, right, uh, are uh, made now. These rules are made. And if it is not followed, it can lead to imprisonment or monetary uh, fines up to 1 lakh or 5 lakhs per day additional fees if it is not taken care of. And uh, there are biomedical waste management and handling rules also, in uh, which was uh, published in 2016. Right? And these all these rules are prescribed by MOEFFC, everybody knows that Ministry of uh, Environment and Forest, and now there, are, there is this climate change also, MOEFCC. So, as this, as what I have put in, on this slide, there is no one size fits all approach. So, each uh, lab or each uh, hospital will have a different kind of a solution where or a problem uh, so we have to give appropriate solution to such kind of uh, problems so i will take questions now and thank you all for listening to me for this uh, maybe 40 45 minutes now so uh, i have my name mobile number and email id also uh, here, if you have any questions, you can contact me on this number, or you can email your questions. If you don't have any now, you can also ask me at this email ID. I can come back to you with a detailed reply. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for listening. So, can we take the question answers now? Yeah, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Okay. So, Dr. V. Sriram uh, has asked you, what is biological war and what precautions general public should take? What is your advice on uh, industrial hygiene with regards to biosafety? So, biological war is something where uh, countries, right, it is between countries. It is also called as bioterrorism now. They, even if it is not uh, openly fought between two countries, they are releasing these infectious agents into other countries and uh, cause economic as well as uh, human uh, losses. Like a lot of people uh, blame, I mean, I don't want uh, to enter into this uh, controversy, but uh, people think that uh, this COVID-19 is also because of one kind of uh, bio, bio, biological war, what was meant for a biological war. This was accidentally released, that is a different issue, but there is an entire lab in Wuhan, where they think that it is it is for um, to make or to make uh, organisms which can be used for uh, biological uh, war or bioterrorism. 
purposes. And how you have to uh, be used, uh, I mean, how you have to, how you, uh, what is that, uh, your, to answer your second question, um, how general public should be given awareness is, uh, it is very difficult at this point of time, right? Uh, you are seeing now like how we are facing a lot of problems in terms of uh, coping up, uh, dealing with, with this, uh, uh, pandemic, not just uh, uh, developing countries, uh, developed uh, uh, economies, economies like uh, US and the countries in Europe, right, are dealing very badly with this uh, COVID situation. So even uh, WHO World Health Organization is also uh, not in a position to directly combat this uh, uh, virus. It, it will definitely take some more time uh, to uh, formulate guidelines or come up with a appropriate like a, a solution to solve this kind of problems. Hope I have answered your question. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. B. Ganesh is asking if you can throw some light about HEPA filters, how to carry out periodical maintenance of the HEPA filters. Okay. So, uh, HEPA filters usually are uh, changed once every year, irrespective of whether it is uh, good or bad. Like during the uh, maintenance of uh, the biosafety cabinet, every year on an annual basis, whether it is used, whether we are using it or not, every year the filters needs to be changed. How is a different uh, question? So the service engineer of that particular manufacturing, uh, um, the manufacturer will come and change the filters. So I have no direct, I have no idea or knowledge on how to change the filters. All I know is it has to be changed on an annual basis. Are there any more questions, Divya? Yes, yes, yes. We are having. Uh, if, uh, Dr. Sriram again asks if is there any audit code for biosafety audit on hospital and pharma industry? So yeah, so far there is no. Uh, they, recently, they have uh, constituted uh, this uh, uh, auditing for uh, biological safety, but this come falls under. Uh, OSTAS, biological safety for or now ISO 45000. So it's falls under that. But specifically for biological safety, uh, American Society of uh, Biological Safety has constituted one, and very soon uh, it will be uh, launched. Okay. Uh... Mr. Shurya Prakasham wants to, uh, has raised in his hand for uh, asking something, but I am having any issue, you know, in allowing him to talk because the mic is disabled. There is an error. If you can, please type your question, sir. Meanwhile, we will move on to the next question. Uh, Mr. B. Ganesh is asking about dunk tank. Please explain about it. Say it again. Say it again. I didn't get the question. Uh, he's asking what a dunk tank is and wants to have an explanation on it. So dunk tank is a tank where uh, you keep your biological material and take it inside your uh, biosafety level 3 cabinet, actually. So this is like... Uh, 
container to take your biological material. You keep it inside the pass box, close it, open it inside, uh, open using that uh, uh, gloves, like rubber gloves, which is provided for the biosafety size 3 cabinet, and uh, work with your biological agent, put it back into the pass box, autoclave it, and uh, di um, dispose it off. So this is uh, the reason why they use the dunk tank for taking the agents. Okay. So Mr. Uh, Aristides the Raja is asking, what is the difference between PSL and biosafety cabinets? Okay. So BSL is biosafety level. So these are different levels of organisms. Right? As I uh, mentioned earlier, like biosafety level one uh, is uh, most safest to work with. However, if it is biosafety level four, right? These are highly pathogenic organisms for which there is no, uh, if there is infection, there is no uh, medication or there is no uh, vaccination for this. So, biosafety levels are, you, we are dealing with or types of organisms. And biosafety cabinets are something where we are using the biosafety cabinets are engineering controls which are used to work with these organisms. For example, if it is a biosafety level 3, which is COVID-19, for which you need biosafety uh, level 2, type 2, B2 cabinets, class 2, B2 cabinets. So, uh, I, I think, uh, are you getting my point? So, biosafety levels are organisms and biosafety cabinets are used to, uh, used to work with these organisms. Are the engineering controls used to work on these organisms? Okay. He also asks if uh, there is any role of CIH personnel in these laboratories. Yes, yes. Yeah, so, uh, what is it? Certified industrial hygienists, right? So they are uh, very much uh, required, like in the sense, like if not directly for all these industrial hygiene, uh, right? Like uh, exposures, right? Uh, they come and do all the analysis at a uh, appropriate time, like all these biosafety cabinet testing, if not testing, right, like all the exposure analysis and everything they do. So biosafety is also a uh, subject in uh, CAH where they have to um, study and get pass through that examination, pass that examination. So biosafety is also a topic there. So in continuation with that, Mr. Uh, Ganesh is asking, what are the decontamination procedures for BSL first level? So uh, depends, again, as I told you. So uh, decontamination, uh, decontamination agents totally depends on what kind of organisms you are working with. So for example, if you are working with blood, right? blood is the type, uh, type 2, sorry, biosafety level 2. Uh, we have to consider it as biosafety level 2 and we use quaternary ammonium compounds to clean or decontaminate blood spills. So biosafety level 1 organism like E. coli, uh, either 10% bleach or 70% ethanol or uh, 70% uh, sodium uh, isopropyl alcohol is good enough for uh, decontaminating uh, such kind of spills. Okay. So there are other, also other agents which you can use, like UV, for example, is also a, a agent which can uh, disinfect um, by safety level one organisms. Okay. So we have a couple of questions in the same category where they are asking um, uh, Udali Shurya Prakasham uncle and uh, Dr. V. Shriram is asking what are the precautions that we have to take during home sample collection 
while testing for covid and in general when we give a normal blood sample for testing so what are the precautions and the difference of precautions in the two uh, tests so uh, if you are giving a home sample i don't know if it is uh, allowed yet uh, for giving home sample for covid so lot of uh, yeah, like, diagnostic laboratories are not uh, in uh, position to take those uh, samples yet but if there are in future if it uh, and uh, there are labs which are prepared to take by uh, your sample so please ensure that they are taking those swabs uh, the swabs are very sterile and uh, those uh, viral transport medium in which they are taking the swabs are also in a new and sterile uh, container so these are the two things which you have to ensure like please ensure that they are opening or uh, opening a new packet of package of this uh, swab right uh, don't let them uh, take it and de- ask them to decontaminate that in front of you because they might have gone to other uh, places where they have collected the samples so if you are not infected you there are chances that they get the infection from uh, from them so please ensure that they are sterilized sterilized or sanitized in front of you before they take a swab from you and if it is a regular blood sample collection uh, people generally take all the precautions uh, when, when they are taking uh, uh, the blood samples or urine samples like all these uh, labs which comes uh, to your doorstep to collect the samples they give uh, uh, all sterile containers to collect the samples and ensure that they are opening up a new uh, syringe needle in front of you so please make sure all these uh, steps are followed uh, before giving the sample okay and also should they be transporting that uh, swabs uh, into the sterile pipettes no no see what happens is they bring one viral transport medium which is the container uh, with uh, probably a, a screw cap so like it, it is a sterile viral transport medium so swab will be uh, like a stick it's uh, like a ear ear bud which is longer which is longer and they take the swab and they directly put it inside the uh, viral transport medium close the screw cap and they will uh, write, label it properly and he uh, take it i have given one myself i was falsely diagnosed yeah like how did they do do it is it the same way or like uh, the lab technician from metropolis had actually come home and okay. uh, they took a, a swab test and okay. blood sample collection so okay. That's why I asked if if, if uh, it's ideal to store those swabs in a um, pipette and then take it to the lab for testing. Pipette? Uh, no, no. They they generally keep it inside one tube. Okay. So so we also uh, do that like regularly uh, in our lab. Okay. So, so I don't work in a diagnostic lab, but we have those swabs where we. Uh, i mean i rather don't work in a human diagnostic lab now so what we do is we take the swab we have viral transport medium put the uh, swab inside that viral transport medium close the screw cap and uh, let it sit in 4 uh, uh, degrees right before we do the rna isolation and all the rna isolation and then we do the cdna synthesis and further processing for you to give the results okay. all right thank you we we'll move on to the next question mr krishnamurthy rao and mr pandurangan are asking what are the standards used in bio safety so here in india we don't have any standards currently like if uh, there are any uh, international clients right we use this uh, cfr codes and all for uh, 
uh, batch processing and everything. But here we don't have any standards as such for products consumption. Other than the biosafety uh, rules, right, which is uh, uh, given by uh, Department of Biotechnology or Indian Council for Medical Research. Other than that, we don't have any uh, codes or standards as such. Okay. So we don't have an established standards and uh, following is a question related to that mr devendra kumar is asking what are the minimum biosafety measures to be taken by an industry or a hospital in industry hospital hospital industry i think there is a spelling is industry or a occupational health center in a uh, industry in a factory yeah, both a general industry and an hospital. What are the measures for biosafety? Minimum measures. Yeah. So actually, basically, for a biosafety uh, for a occupational health center in a factory, what happens is they may uh, look for how the waste is being segregated. Biomedical waste is segregated. That is the only major thing which will be seen uh, by any uh, government agency or audits auditors like how it is being segregated like the biomedical waste rules of uh, which were uh, prescribed in 2018 should be followed and accordingly all the waste should be collected in the appropriate color coded bags so these are the uh, this is the major requirement for uh, uh, appropriate uh, segregation of biomedical waste. And for hospital industry, uh, again, like uh, same uh, biomedical waste should be segregated in appropriate way. And all these decontamination practices uh, should be followed, right? Depending on like which area of a hospital uh, it is. Okay. So these kind of uh, uh, steps should be taken to ensure that uh, they are not deviating from any biomedical uh, guidelines stipulated by ICMR or uh, MEAFCC. Okay. Thank you. And uh, again, Mr. Krishna Murthy Rao and Pandraman sir are asking if there is any audit format for biosafety for each level that we mentioned. So audit format in the sense uh, like uh, uh, audit checklist or is there a, a, something like that? But I didn't get the question. So yeah, that is what they are asking. Probably a checklist or any format uh, uh, that um, is used at each level to yeah. ensure biosafety. Yeah, the checklist like. Uh, uh, American, I have created. I mean, we can have our own checklist. I have made one on one checklist for myself. I can share that actually. I can share the checklist. You can uh, share it. If it is, uh, okay. We can yeah. uh, email it across as well from the safety cluster uh, email. Sure, and, sure. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, yeah. uh, Mr. Ganesh is asking what are the health monitoring? Uh, what are health monitoring? What health monitoring uh, facilities are required for medical professionals for BSL-1 and BSL-4 grade? So BSL-1, uh, as I mentioned, it doesn't require any medical surveillance. BSL-2 also doesn't require any medical surveillance. So your medical surveillance starts only after BSL. Some uh, clients, right, some industries, uh, they require BSL or BSL-2 as well. Like if you are working for uh, uh, working using uh, blood, right? There is something called the human blood bone pathogen program. So for such human blood bone pathogen programs, uh, they require uh, employees to take uh, hepatitis and tetanus vaccination, right? However, for uh, BSL level. BSL 3 and 4, 
since there is no vaccination or treat uh, prophylactic prophylactic treatment for such kind of uh, uh, working with such kind of uh, organisms so the medical examination need to be done on a uh, routine basis like uh, like they need to get uh, them get tested on a monthly basis to ensure that they have not contracted any uh, illnesses right uh, so they have to go to the occupational health center to give them uh, to get their reports Mr. Mohit Jindal, good evening, sir. Any specific biological hazard to which today's industries are vulnerable to apart from COVID-19? So, I repeat, uh, he's asking if there is any vulnerable biological hazard apart from COVID-19, which industries can face? So it, it depends on uh, uh, which industry it is. Like for example, if it is a pharma industry, day in and day out there are hazards for uh, the um, bi bi biological safety hazards. And depending on like what labs they are. So if it is a biosafety level three or a four lab, uh, four labs there are only few in India. So uh, so, for example, if somebody is working on a lentivirus, right, in a uh, CRISPR Cas9, that if they are using CRISPR Cas9 technology. So, these labs are most vulnerable and they need to take appropriate measure and they should have a biosafety professional uh, in their team to ensure that uh, risk assessments are done on a periodic basis and uh, ensure that uh, there are appropriate medical surveillance programs. Uh, so not just that even if some industries like, say, for example, uh, um, hospital industry, so they deal with uh, human blood on a routine or a, almost a, a, every day. So they have to ensure that they have this program and they have a bio biosafety professional on board and take care of uh, all the biosafety related risk assessments and ensure that uh, none of their uh, employees contract any uh, infections because of, uh, I mean, occupational related uh, infections. Mr. Aristudus Raja uh, is asking, for sample analysis of histoplasma capsulatum fungi, which biosafety cabinet is recommended to use? So I'm not sure like that. I mean, I will not be able to uh, get that uh, like specifically. There are several uh, agents like that. You can give me that. I can get back to you on that. You can email me on that. I'll let you know. So I don't know to which level it belongs to. Belong to. So based on like what level it is, I can give uh, which biosafety cabinet can be used. Okay. Uh, he is also asking, is it Legionella vulnerable at the current period where most of the human beings are using air condition slash heater? Yes, yes, definitely. Legionella is a big uh, challenge, right? Not just at homes, even in industry where the uh, where, uh, air conditioners or air handling units are used. This Legionella is a big uh, problem. You have to, that's why keep changing or that maintenance team should be uh, taking care of these uh, uh, filters in a periodic time. Ensure that uh, these are all, uh, and, uh, they, they are all cleaned and they are all uh, maintained appropriately to prevent this Legionella. Okay. So this is also present in any other uh, appliances that we have at home, sir? Home, usually we don't um, get the contract that much, but mainly in industries, right? Uh, this is very vulnerable, like in uh, industrial setup. Okay. Home, okay, yeah, it's not that uh, prevalent. Okay, thank you. That's all uh, questions that we have, sir. Sure, sure. Uh, thanks. I mean, definitely there will be some questions. Uh, 
If not immediately, there might be some which is triggering at a later stage. You have my contact information. You can email me at any time uh, to get uh, anything related to biological safety from me. Thank you, thank you. And thanks very much uh, for uh, including me in this team. And uh, hope, uh, I think I have come to a new family now. So it would be very nice uh, connecting with all the safety professionals on this platform. Thank you, sir. I now present the vote of thanks to you. This session was a tremendous eye opener, listening in depth of the importance of uh, biological safety as the entire humanity is now suffering its greatest enemy, COVID 19, today. As part of this battle, biosecurity is of vital importance as it is responsible for preventing risks. Uh, to health and uh, uh, to the environment from exposure to biological agents that causes these diseases. From every webinar's takeaway, we learn a little and share our presentation on YouTube channel, uh, Safety Cluster, in order to convey this message that safety begins from individual level and escalates through community level. That is our uh, uh, you can say mission and vision to uh, spread importance of safety on all aspects, all fields as much as we can. Let us all strive to uh, upkeep our individual responsibility to maintain safety standards in our respective fields of work and at home. Thank you so much for your time and sharing your utmost knowledge with us. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I now end the session.